many different places and I'm really, really thrilled that you could join us today. And finally, we have Dr. Farzana Salim and I am so excited about Dr. Salim. She is at Stanford and um, she is an assistant professor at Stanford. And a lot of her work deals with racial socialization, which we know is influenced uh, by media and information literacy. So I am thrilled uh, to have these three panelists who have so much information and knowledge to share. So well, we're thrilled to be here. <laughs> yes, so thank you. So um, how we're gonna get started, you know, we are talking race, media, and information literacy. And we know that, you know, this is a hot topic, especially now. Um, we know that there is so much going on. So I, I first wanna just center the conversation with each of you getting an opportunity to talk very briefly about your work, um, how you think about race, media, and information literacy. And then we will go from there. So why don't we start first? Uh, who wants to start? Jasmine, your vibes are telling me you're ready. But <laughs> it's, hard to, it's hard to get that kind of energy on, you know, on in the online space. But I definitely felt like you said, I'm ready. Yeah, well, uh, yes, as a daytime talk show producer, uh, race and the way we communicate about race is really important. We are very much about diversity and the beautiful, most beautiful sense of the word. Uh, shows cannot, we want to show the, what the actual America looks like when I work for my talk shows and, and I've worked for many, many of them. I've worked for the Steve Harvey talk show. I've worked currently for Kelly Clarkson. I was on Busy Tonight, uh, that show as well. And that diversity is the backbone of society because a society is diverse. So you have to play that into reality. And if you have any media, any form of media that is skewed one way or the other, that means all white and or all black doesn't show what a true America is as much as I would just love to have an all black everything. <laughs> yes, no, thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, Farzana. Excited to be here. Yeah, so I think for my work, a lot of my research centers around how we talk to kids about race, understanding discrimination and preparing for and managing it. So. Um, that includes like coping strategies to manage race related stress. That also includes like instilling racial pride in youth so that when they're experiencing discrimination, not only do they have some strategies to manage it, but they also um, can pull on these messages that help build them up and have pride in, in their um, identity. And so I think that for sure the, the connection between um, thinking about racial socialization is what we call this kind of in the research world and, and how that kind of aligns with media is really important, particularly um, I think scholars are starting to now understand uh, online and media context as another form of racial socialization, conveying messages to youth about race and discrimination. And so um, there's absolutely um, a lot of relevance to the media context as well. Yeah, absolutely. Carrie. Hey, Jeanette. Um, you know, when I first became a columnist in the late 1990s, I, you know, I, I didn't want to be pigeonholed as a black columnist. Uh, I told myself I'd, I'd stay away from writing about race for a while uh, so people could see that to write about other things. I think by my seventh column, I was already writing about race. And this is actually my second stint at the Express News. I was there for 17 years and left for eight years and just came back in December. And I wrote a lot about race as a columnist. And I wrote more about race than any of the other columnists, but I wrote about other things besides race. But what happens is that if you're a black or Latino columnist and you write a column about race, you'll get these folks ask, asking, why do you write about race all the time, even if you don't? And Coming back this time around after George Floyd, I wrote a column saying that as much as I wrote about race my first time here at the Express News, I sometimes let those voices get in my head. And there should have been other times when I wrote about race. Other times when I should have used the platform that I had to explain the things that I know from experience and, 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 and sight. And so, uh, after George Floyd, I wrote a column doing a mea culpa and saying I should have done it more, but I won't let this happen again. 
And if I have to write about race, column after column after column, I'm going to do it because until folks learn what we're up against, what we've been up against, we're not going to ever deal with it. So, yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, thank you. You know, I appreciate that. And, you know, it, it's, it's interesting, right? You know, thinking about how we use our platforms, we see a lot of that right now um, when we talk about race and media. And, you know, before we um, kind of unpack, I want us to think about the last decade, but before we go there, I would love for us to just talk about this moment, right? I think, Carrie, you alluded to some of this where, you know, in this moment, you've decided that you will um, use your platform to talk more about race. And I want to think about in this moment, how it shaped um, each of your work as we think about race and media. I think that especially with me, my platform is is very different than than theirs because I am under the gaze of a larger corporation, right? While you guys are allowed to speak so loudly about race and think conversations like that, mine has to be filtered through a very specific type of lens for the daytime America audience, which as we know is middle America, white, mostly kind of in the country, maybe they don't wanna hear about race very often. So the Kelly Clarkson show specifically has used my knowledge of being a black woman and decided to allow me to speak on race before, which is kind of unheard of, especially for the daytime audience. It's, it's really beautiful what we're doing, but it's also gotten us a lot of flack, which I don't mind. Please come fight me about, come fight me about race all day, every day. Cause I'm ready, <laughs> to, I'm ready to rumble. And it's now we're at a point where we don't have like, white people and people not not of color, and I'm just gonna be frank about it, they don't have the privilege to be quiet anymore because we don't have, we've never had that privilege. Like the fact of the matter is that you, you said that you felt like you couldn't write about race because people were like, oh yeah, like why are you writing about race? When people forget, it's not you writing about race, it's race being put on you. You don't think about being black when you go to bed at night. Nobody does. Everyone tells you, hey, you're black. Hey, you're male. Hey, you're this. You don't think of yourself that way. So because we're put on this, we are now forced to regurgitate those things back into society. And we have to, at this point, scream even louder than we've been screaming since the last 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. We've been screaming much louder than this. So we, as Black people and people of color, are screaming, but I also think that now people are listening, which is a really interesting thing since the, the deaths of George Floyd and since the deaths of Breonna Taylor, people are now like, oh, this is messed up what is happening to half of our population. Yeah, I think for me, um, at, at, in more of a research lane, I've, I've always been very um, committed to thinking about how, how my work serves the communities that I work with. But I think it's been giving me even more of a push to think about the translation of this work um, in, a, in different ways. So how can I take maybe what I found in this article and put it into a one page, um, you know, one page write up for, for family. So um, whether that is within an outlet, like, you know, Successful Black Parenting Magazine, whether that's in a teacher education magazine where teachers can have access to this information. So thinking about, Act, you know, ways that are more applied and community focused to translate this work feels very important for me in this moment, especially because my, my most recent work is really thinking about addressing race in schools and how teachers and school counselors can help, um, help youth manage racial stress and trauma and address it in the school context. And so um, I've been talking to teachers and hearing them say, we need concrete strategies. We don't really feel comfortable or know sometimes how to bring up these issues, how to bring up things that youth are seeing within the media. And so a lot of my attention has been on thinking about um, different ways to give this information to community members um, in a range of um, methods, whether that's short videos, you know, these um, magazine articles or interventions. I think an, another thing that I've been thinking a lot about too, I think it's a critical, it's always been an important topic that needs to, to have work done, right? Um, so whether, and that's in multiple kind of um, methods or modes, but I think as someone who studies racism and reads about articles on um, race-related stress and racial trauma really often, I think I've also been um, having to take a step back too and, and, and think about what it means to take care of myself in these moments in a different way. 
um, because I think so often as a scholar of color, um, mixed race black woman, I, um, I've had to reevaluate um, how this is impacting me, how current events are impacting me, how that's kind of, um, I'm re kind of thinking about this in my, in my research. I'm also, I also do therapy. Um, so I'm trained as a clinical community psychologist. And so if these topics are coming up in my clinical work and, um, you know, I'm having this as a vicarious experience, which I'm sure we'll probably get to that a bit later on, I think really making sure that I take I'm time sure to, to care for myself. Um, that was my Apple watch, apologize. Um, in these moments, I think is, is, has been, um, I've been noticing the need for that uh, in a very different way um, over the last several months. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think this moment is, has stunned everyone. I mean, when you, from, I mean, I mean, no, no one sees big moments coming. No one, no one, you know, saw December 1st, 1955, Rosa Parks not getting on the bus. Rosa Parks didn't see it coming at that very second. So we don't see these big moments uh, when they're coming. I mean, but, but jo George Floyd is the most, uh, maybe the most unexpected, because I don't think, it, no, no one could think after seeing so many other videos of, of, of black folks being killed by police or vigilantes that one more would spark this, you know, this largest protest movement we've ever had in this nation, millions of people. And, and, I, and like everyone else, I'm trying to figure out why this one. And I, you know, I, I do think it has something to do with the pandemic, everyone being at home, having to watch it, over and over again. And also with the other cases of, of blacks being killed, it's always been in the flash and seconds of a gunshot. And this was eight minutes and 46 seconds. And mm -hmm. it's something, something shook, something about that shook the consciousness of people who I never thought could be shook. And then you've seen what's happening. I mean, from you know, from NASCAR doing with the Confederate flag to the the statues going down. So, I I do believe that we are in a moment unlike any we've ever been before, where we have the opportunity to teach about just how how entrenched racism is in our country, the legacy of slavery, which is where where this stems from, the brutality of slavery, that it wasn't something that just ended in 1865 and everybody went about their ways, that everything that we're experiencing now is, 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 is tied up with the, with the formation of this country, with the history of this country. And I, I'm surprised at how long this moment has lasted. And I don't know how much longer it is going to last, but I do truly believe it is an opportunity for us to teach. I think people are more old people. Let's be, let me be, white folks are more open to learning things now than they were, say, at the beginning of the year. And we have to take advantage of that. I kind of want to piggyback after what you were saying is that the pandemic really did bring all these things to light because people are forced to be in their homes and they're being played this video over and over and over in their face. And now they're kind of, they will never understand or feel what we feel when we watch these things, but they're like, oh, this man was doing what, huh? They really had to sit with it and think about it. And they were like, it didn't make sense. Also, it has now become in vogue to be socially like, like to be on the social justice side. It's now become popular. And the kids of the TikTok started that. Like we have 14 year olds and 15 year olds and 16 year olds going after their racist family members and being like, this is my friend from school. She's done nothing to me. Why don't you like her? So the pandemic has absolutely, and the children, I would say that the pandemic and the kids, this culmination of what's happening in the world kind of blew it up and it just happened to be for George Floyd and for Breonna Taylor. And because it's really beautiful 
I find it to be very beautiful because they really do say that like kids, the kids of America will change the world. And I didn't believe that because I was a kid of America for a long time in my life. And I was like, nothing is changing, but they came up and they truly have blown it out of the water from, from the kids of TikTok, from the children who are being uh, shot in these schools. They've all decided to become the adults that we really should have been off topic of race, but I just wanted to say that it's the no, children. And, and no, very on topic. Right, I think this idea of, you know, the kids um, of TikTok started this, and you know, I think as we talk about race and media and information literacy, thinking about things, you know, like TikTok and some of these other social media platforms, and kind of how we've shifted over these years. Right, if we think about the last decade, social media has been a huge place uh, for information, you know, um, whether for good or for bad, and so I guess kind of thinking about this um, in your you know, respective fields, I'm wondering um, just some reflections on what you thought about social media. I mean, you know, you talked about TikTok and I think we have a moment where parents are kind of at a, they're in an interesting place. I was on a call with a group of parents last Friday and there was a parent who said, you know, it seems like everybody's just on TikTok and we're not focusing on some of the, you know, the issues, but, you know, as I hear you talk, um, Jasmine, it sounds like, you know, there is there is information that is important on TikTok, that it has, you know, that some of our social media um, spaces have become platforms uh, to talk about race, to be able to be exposed to different media. And so I would just love for you all to kind of dig in on that, no matter where your stance is, you know, just how you feel about, you know, over the last 10 years, especially, you know, the surge um, in social media and how that plays a role in information. Social media uh, is now the new, it's the new media. We can just be clear with it. It's not just the social, like this is where people now are going to find their news. They don't read the New York Times anymore. They don't listen to NPR. They go on Twitter, they go on Facebook and they go on TikTok. That is partially why we have the president we have today because he is a social, he is a now this social media maven, let's just call it what it is. He did what he was supposed to do. And now unfortunately he's the president. It is social media is the reason why people knew that there were protests going on in the world for George Floyd and for Breonna Taylor. The news weren't, wasn't really reporting on that, but because there were so many happenings, the news had to. It was almost like a retroactive situation. It was very interesting to watch and see. And it is just like social media is the only way, especially now because of the pandemic, because we can't go talk to each other anymore, that's the only way we can communicate and get to, to see what's actually happening in, outside of the world. I didn't even know what was happening in Seattle because I felt like it wasn't on the news, was ha wasn't on the news. I found out through Twitter and I was like, get it Seattle, do I need to move there? It was just very, it was very, it's always so interesting, especially since we're right in the middle of it to like look at it from a 360 view. Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of add to that. I, I see social media as definitely this opportunity to have information access in a different way. Um, so it's not, you're not just limited to what is written in the newspaper, or what, is, what is broadcast on your local news channels, you um, in general on the internet have access to a lot of information. Um, and I think for younger folks, kind of going back to that conversation, I think for younger people, um, as Jasmine mentioned, uh, this, these are spaces where they can um, maybe get information about news that they might not other, otherwise get. I think that it also provides an opportunity for you to find community and support, right? So there are definitely ways that it can be helpful, especially in the context of the pandemic and, and perhaps needing to develop community in a different way um, during this time. But I also think that it's important to acknowledge um, the, the, you know, the flip side of that. And that as, as we as adults and even youth are exposing ourselves to content that is racially stressful, um, that it can have an impact on us. And I think with media, it can sometimes feel like you're inundated with information or you're flooded with information so much so that, um, you know, it can be overwhelming, it can be overstimulating, you might you know, you will have kind of a different responses to it. And a lot of times if we're, you know, re-watching the George Floyd video, for example, over and over again, that's re-exposing us over and over again to um, 
you know, this, this potentially traumatic, this thing that could be traumatic for you and was a traumatic event, right? So if you're rewatching that over and over again, I think it's, it is something to be aware of and how that is impacting your mood and your ability to, um, to kind of, uh, to be able to kind of focus and get, um, momentum for for movement right so i think uh in many ways we can think about um social media and as an opportunity um and can per, and you know can provide opportunities for support and community but i think it's also equally important to recognize um some of the consequences of it especially when we think about re-traumatizing ourselves experiencing some of this vicariously by association um, so it doesn't have to directly happen to you for it to have a negative mental health consequences for you. Um, and, I, and that's just something to keep in mind as we're, you know, thinking about the pros and cons of it. Yeah, I mean, so, uh, yeah, the, the the force that that social media is cannot be uh, overstated. And and it has been for a few years. I mean, you go back to the Arab uprising and, and other movements overseas, you know, the young folks were using social media to get information out about, about what they were up against. And, uh, uh, and, I, and I think that one of the problems with, with one of the, the pitfalls with social media, and it can be the pitfall with any form of media, is that, yeah, we, we are inundated with so much information and, we do get overstimulated and you can't read everything, but you also can't verify everything. And I, so I think that there can be a tendency sometimes on social media where folks will see something and just and just run with it as a fact. Uh, you know, something just starts starts to spread, you know, be on, on Facebook or Twitter. And I also don't think as someone who works for for old media, a 100 and, you know, 55 year old newspaper, there's not a conflict between social media and, 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 and the old media because one of the great things I love about, about Twitter is that it tells me about newspaper stories or radio stories uh, that, that, I, that I would have normally missed. So social media is this, this besides getting information quickly out there, it also is a clearinghouse for all the information out there. But then it, it becomes our responsibility to to uh, to sift through it and to and to do some critical thinking and, and check for ourselves. But uh, you no, know, social media is 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 with us to stay, and I think that's a overall it's a good thing. Yeah, yeah, and I agree to your point, Carrie. That you know, I know that I'm a person that I might not have been watching something on TV and I'll get on social media and it's like, oh, that's on, let me turn that on. But it's also has, you know, I might not have listened to NPR, but because my friends are, or people that I follow on different social media, I might click on that link and listen in. So I think that point is important that, um, you know, social media and the, you know, old media, as you uh, refer to it, Carrie, that they're not at odds with each other. Um, that, you know, it actually can work hand in hand. Um, so I, I, I like that point. We do have a question um, from someone in the audience here who is a Black journalism major. And the question is, how do you pull back and process the information before reporting about racial tragedies? And I want you to think about this too, whether it's writing about them as a researcher, uh, Dr. S uh, Salim, whether, you know, Jasmine, it's thinking about putting a show together where now you're gonna tackle this particular topic, or in your case, Carrie, um, actually writing, you know, deciding to write about these, how do you take that moment and what does that pullback and process, processing of information look like, especially considering the fact that the person asking this question is a fellow black journalism major? Well, um, I didn't go to school for journalism, so I just want to be very clear that when it comes to building shows and building in segments about what is happening on here, it's been very difficult personally for me to pull back and process because I just have a lot of just like, I want to fight, like that's just my personality, but it's it's hard for me to answer this question because I don't have, it's not a journalism thing. So I'm not, I don't think I'm just the right person to answer it. So I'm just gonna. Sure, Carrie, I saw you. Uh... 
Yeah, and 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 to be honest, Jasmine, I I didn't go to school for journalism either, so I never never took a journalism class. I I I take the question a couple of ways. I think uh, first of all, I take it as as pulling back to what we were just talking about earlier is verifying the facts, is making sure that what you're going to what you're going to use to write about to, or for your research. Is actually true. Uh, that's uh, you know one of the, as you said earlier, one of the the, the pitfalls with social media is that uh, information gets out there that may not always be correct. I remember back in the day when you know, with when when people first started getting blogs, I would say that you know one of the the great things about blogs is that anyone can have them, but one of the bad things about blogs is that anyone can have them because you can so you you can whatever platform you have you can just put stuff out there and and it's not it, it not be true and then people will run with it so i do think that especially as a journalist whatever you know sometimes if the story is too good maybe the story is too good because it's not true always the first responsibility as to, to that particular student, your, your first responsibility as a journalist is uh, to have the facts. Uh, so I, I, I take that question as first of all, being able to verify the information you're getting, but I also think it's part of, uh, it's, it's, it's pulling back as we've talked about earlier for some self-care because I mean, this, there, there is a, it's a lot of trauma and apart from what's happening in this George Floyd moment with the social justice movement, we've also been just, we're exhausted because of the president. We're exhausted. And so I do believe there's, there's some pulling back and taking uh, holidays away from social media, from any media, from technology, a day or two just to for your own self care and and to take care of yourself because you will burn out and whatever fight we're in right now it's, it's going to be a long fight so we're going to need everyone at their best yeah i definitely want to echo that that piece to taking that that space um, whether it's reflection whether it's a break i think for me um, I'm not always good at it, right? So there are moments where sometimes I jump in and I will say like, what I'm action oriented, like what can I do? How can I help, right? Um, but when I am able to step back and catch myself in that, I think processing my own emotions first, like how, how am I feeling? Because instead of me kind of seeing this and jumping into wanting to maybe write on this immediately or, or you know, put out an op-ed immediately, sometimes I, sometimes that can be a way to get out your emotions and it can feel cathartic for you. Um, other times it, you might find that you need to find other ways to just check in with yourself and see how you're feeling. Um, and I think sometimes taking that, that pause and that um, reflection and that break can be really helpful. And sometimes, I mean, to finding spaces where you can, can do that. So, I mean, it could be with colleagues, it could be with friends, it could be with family, but wherever that space is, and if it's alone, that's fine too. But thinking about that, um, another thing that comes up for me is just, uh, you know, in terms of your career or your job, um, a, a lot of times I will think about, you know, what is what is my role in response to this? I mean, I have a lot of personal things that I can do to respond to this just as um, an individual, but in terms of putting on my like work hat as a psychologist, as a researcher, I think about what is, um, what is needed? How do I use the platform that I have and the role that I have to either raise awareness around this topic, to, um, to, to kind of make change in this topic, to mobilize others um, and, and recognizing that you can't take it all on yourself, right? So um, that's something I, I've had to learn too and figuring out how to potentially come together with other people to to do the lifting together or recognizing like, you know what, I did like 10 lifts the last week. So this week I'm taking a break, but I can, you know, be in a supportive role or because I've brought people together, I'm that, that is still going. We're still working in a positive direction, knowing that um, again, all, all of the work cannot fall on you, but figuring out 
you know, what the role is that you want to have and, and the change that you can make with the platform that you have, I think um, is, is really important to reflect on. Yeah, well said. Uh, we do have another question and this question kind of shifts uh, a little bit. We're still thinking about uh, social media and influence, but the question is, do you think that youngsters are missing out on an opportunity to influence and maybe even form governments using technology tools such as social media? Could we see an advent of technocracy, technology plus democracy? That would make my little heart. <laughs> I don't want to take it on. Who's taking that question? <laughs> I would, that would make my little heart so happy if the kids of America were like, we've taken over, we're done, we're not doing this anymore. That would be great. That would, I don't, I think that some youngsters, and I should stop calling them youngsters. I don't know. Let's just break it into their age. That was the word used. So I was trying to use the word Young, that was like, used. Yeah. But like maybe, I guess like these, these 13, let's say 13. To the small adults. <laughs> small adults, yes. The that's wise ones. There. Yeah, the wise the small ones. adults. But I feel like they're like, Partially, yes, they're like, yeah, I want to I want to change the world. But they're also so young that they don't understand the amount of work that it takes to go into that. So they're like, I want to change the world. And then they're like, how? So, which is what we've all been asking our entire lives is how do we change the world? So that question never ends. So I think that as much as like, yes, that would be dope if we could get a TikTok democracy in this in this beautiful world. I don't think that children understand the amount of work time, effort, and possible danger that they might be putting themselves into by doing that. Because let's be clear, by starting a, a new government via TikTok, that is a revolutionary act, which is beautiful, but it's still a revolutionary act into this current government that would be a threat. Yeah, and when, when you were talking, Jasmine, it, it reminded me of like some of the things that could be helpful though in thinking about young folks mobilizing, right? And, and responding and um, stepping up to address and advocate um, or respond to some of these issues. And so the first thing that comes to mind for me is like, okay, well, what about, where is like their level of like critical consciousness? Because that seems like the development of kind of a awareness of um, race and uh, systemic racism and also understanding um, you know, how you can step in to address these issues, right? So I think having that is really important first for young folks. And, and they, a lot of times they need help with developing that. So whether it's their parents or teaching them to have a more critical lens and how they understand um, issues that happen in the world, right? Um, within their neighborhood that happens to them as individuals, whether it's teachers, um, I think that it first requires them having that kind of critical lens and awareness of these topics. And then I absolutely think that young folks can be activists, can use um, the platforms that they have in, in their identities and the roles that they have, whether it's, you know, as a student, as a community member, um, to, to, you know, to make change happen as it relates to responding to racialized incidents um, or like using resistance strategies, right? So teaching them like what, what are the different ways that um, I think us as adults can help them um, think through here are some options and how I can respond to these things that I'm seeing in the media that are making me upset, that are making me want to change the world, that are making me, um, you know, want to do something. I think that we can help shape that direction for them. Yeah, I, I agree with everything that's, that's been said and I'm, I'm just still kind of, I, I mean, just, it'd be a hell of a novel or movie. I mean, just government, I mean, kids taking, creating their own government. Someone mentioned TikTok government. It's just something that I'd not thought about, but it's like, it, it's, it's uh, and yeah, it certainly would be some dangers, but I, I love the audacity of the question. I love the audacity of, of the thought. Uh, but also, the, yes, you know, just still uh, any, you know, using social media as a form of, of resistance, a form of, of, of nonviolent protest. Uh, there are many ways that, that anybody, including young people, can, can engage in, 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 in nonviolent protest, civil disobedience. Uh, to influence the government. And, and someone uh, alluded, I think Jasmine alluded earlier to 
the kids at Parkland. I, you know, at, first of all, what was amazing about that was that I, you remember when the kid, when the, the kids, the students were being interviewed uh, the day of the shooting, uh, the young man David Hogg, and and they and you know they were interviewing each other and they're doing this they're doing this in real time. I mean, they just seen friends be slaughtered, and then in real time, they're interviewing each other. They're educating uh, the nation about what's going on, and they're already starting this this movement. And, and one of the reasons for that is that particular school district in which they, they live, from what I understand, is one that students are very steeped in, in, in civics, in understanding how government works. But to me, that was, that's one of the most inspiring things that, that's happened within the last 10 years was were those students at, at Parkland just taking, just taking this 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 uh, question of guns taking leadership of I mean I I really thought that they were going to win I believe they should have won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2018 for what they did but it's just an example the latest example of how throughout history it always has been young people people young people in their in their teens in their in their early twenties who have taken the lead of any significant social movement, whether it's the civil rights movement, whether it, it was, uh, you know, uh, the Philippines and Tiananmen Square and Haiti, it's always been young people at the forefront. Yeah. Can I ask a question to my, my fellow panelists? Because uh, yeah. when I hear like, awesome, yes, our kids are being activists, our kids are doing this, but don't, it, isn't it almost like, they're getting some of that childhood taken away from them if they have to go save the world. You know, like it's it's unfair almost that that now it's like, well, we didn't do it. It's on you now. It it feels wholly unfair to me. I was wondering if what do you guys think? No, you're, you're right. It's an it's an indictment of us. It's an any any generation of young folks who feel the need and in fact do take the lead in whatever the uh, the movement is is it's implicitly, explicitly an, an indictment of the generations um, ahead of them who didn't do what they're doing. It's a good point. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. I, um, and I also think that, that it's possible to have a, a somewhat of a balance, right? Like, I, I don't know that it's fair to say, make this your whole life, right? And, and do all of this now. Um, I think that there could be some sort of balance, like taking steps to figure out, okay, what, what form of activism resonates best with you? Like, what do you as, you know, cause I think each of us, we have our own ways to, um, to, to kind of respond to, to these incidents that are happening. Um, and I think they have to suit our personality. And so I think taking steps early on to figure out um, for kids or teenagers who are interested in this, like, what am I, what am I good at? What type of role can I have? And how can I start practicing this now, which um, might lead to like a lifetime of me doing this, or it could be me kind of just exploring what feels right and what feels good for me. And how do I feel like I am um, helping to, to move um, my, my community um, my, um, you know, my community forward or even thinking about generations to come. So I think that there might be, a, there can be a way perhaps to have it be a bit more balanced in, in, in the way that it doesn't have to kind of take over their whole childhood, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, well said. Um, in the essence of time, I kind of want us to think about the future, right? Where we're going. If we think about the last 10 years, you know, Jasmine, as you all mentioned, that was the Parkland and there have been many school shootings um, that we've, you know, had over the last decade. We think about Sandra Bland, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, a pandemic. We went from Obama to Trump, which, you know, we've, we've done, a, it's been a decade, you know, and uh, <laughs> I'm wondering, what do you think the next 10 years looks like for us in terms of race and media? Where do we go from here? Well, now that the conversation quote unquote has been started, 
this, that's what everyone's saying is that now the conversation has been started, even though we've all been talking about this for, for years. But now that the conversation has been started, it is the next 10 years will be, we will see whether this conversation truly resonated with people or if we're going to redo this again in 10 years, if we're really, really going to have to wake people up and shake people. Um, I think also what happens in the next 10 years lies a lot on this next election. Um, whoever becomes president, that shapes history further than I think 2016 did because we already know what happened in 2016. So now it it doesn't get better if if he becomes reelected again. That's my personal thing. So if he's elected again, I think that it's going to be a lot more openly open um, uh, protests at the White House. It's going to be a lot more media coverage of 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 that, it's gonna be a lot more coverage of these these public of people being like, you guys said that you're gonna talk about race, but you've never talked about race. Like literally, I feel like it all hinges on the election. And maybe that's just me just being like terrified, but that is truly what I believe. Yeah, I um I agree with a, a lot of um, of what you said here. And I think just really um you know, from a research perspective, I think we really need to hone in on understanding what it means to receive this inundation of racialized content and racial trauma through social media. Um, we don't know that yet. We don't know the long-term effects of it, but I, I can imagine it might show up like us experiencing the trauma right in front of us. But I think that there needs to be some, um, we need definitely need more research on that. And I also, again, in this kind of piece of, um, you know, how do I use my role in, in my hat to make change? I think thinking about ways that media um, and just technology in general can be helpful in addressing some of these things. So whether I know some people are thinking about creating apps, right? So there's kind of like, um, there might be apps that are related to uh, specifically like racial healing. There might be um, different uh, ways that we can find uh, opportunities to kind of heal and support through media and technology. So that those are a couple of things that come up for me. And I think um, us not losing momentum, right? So uh, that that can be talking to the black community and, and also talking to allies because we need both. So I think that the momentum that people feel and the, um, you know, the passion that people feel in this moment, I, I would just encourage everyone to be able to, to try to hold that and carry that on. And I think a part of that is recognizing that this is a marathon, right? So if we exhaust ourselves right now in this part of the race, it's going to be harder, you know, 10 years from now to try to keep up momentum. So I think recognizing that this is a long-term, um, you know, long-term thing. And so figuring out again, how can we, um, you know, take, take part and um, make change in the way that we can as individuals, thinking about both that short and long-term perspective. I, I totally agree. Uh, it, it, it's it's maintaining the momentum while at the same time remembering that it's a marathon. Uh, people, every four years, we say this is the most important election in our lifetime. This truly is the most important election in our lifetime. If if he's reelected, and I, and I like the way we don't even say his name, but if he's reelected, it, it, it's 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 different. I mean, it's it's different, and it gets worse. And but I, but because I truly believe he's going to get his butt kicked, and I think what we have to make, and if if that happens, we have to realize that just because you know Joe and Kamala are in the White House, it doesn't mean we become complacent. It means we can, you know, it means we have more space to do this, uh, but we can't become complacent. Everything that we that that we're doing now, we need to to up it, maintain the momentum, and again, just stay strong until you know you know Stony the road we tried. Just lift every voice and sing. You know, we just and, until until victory is won. Yeah, no, I think that was very well said, and you know we're in the the last couple of minutes, um, and so I kind of just want us to think about you know, in the last pieces, I think we all talked about the importance of self-care, 
right? And how this is taking a toll when we talk about race and media and you all are involved in this, whether from a research perspective or, you know, you are a producer, you are a columnist. I would love for you to end with how you're taking care of yourself um, in this moment and any advice for others um, who are also carrying the weight of delivering information of, you know, analyzing information, but also taking care of themselves. Um, it's really important to surround yourself with people who are going through similar situations. Uh, it, for me, it's really helpful that I have friends who I don't have to say a lot to to get them to understand where my mental space is. Um, and also just make sure that like you are true to yourself, like that gut feeling that you feel that if you wake up one morning and you're like, I can't do it, whatever that is, is to you, don't do it. It is okay. You will, it will be there tomorrow for you to do. You will survive. It is important that you take care of you before you take care of everyone. And I know that's as cliche as possible, but, and I go through that all the time. I, I, I'm a giver. I like to, to give to people and be there for people. But if my, if I'm empty, there's nothing that I can do to save or help anyone. So as long as you just make sure that you are pouring into yourself always in whatever way that feels good to you, then that is the, the truest, best form of self-care, I think. I'm listening to a lot of music, especially at night. Yeah, I think to kind of finding opportunities for joy um, because sometimes we we can get really inundated and can feel hopeless. Um, and so I think I've had to be intentional about finding things that bring me joy. Um, and, and you can have that, right? So some people are like, I don't have time for joy. Like this isn't a joyous moment. We have too much work to do. And I, I like to challenge that idea a bit because yes, there's a lot of work to do. But again, it, it's that piece that um, Jasmine was saying, you, you can't pour from like an empty, um, from an empty base, right? So you have to make sure that you are, staying as full as you can while also um, doing the work, right? And, and again, that feeling of, of yourself can, can look like journaling. It can look like building community spaces. It can look like um, finding things that just in general are um, help bring you energy. So I think kind of protecting yourself in that way can, is, can be really um, helpful in terms of self-care. Yes. Well, I wanna thank you all, we are out of time. I just wanna shout out to everybody who's watching and participating. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, I follow the NAP ministry on all social media. And from that, from following them, I am always left with this idea that rest is a form of resistance. We are always being fed information. Uh, it is great to be active on social media. We talked about it as a tool, but we also need those holidays that Carrie talked about where we can just rest and be good to ourselves. So thank you so much, especially to our panelists. Um, thank you for being so given of your time. Thank you, it's been great.